So in my few minutes, I would like to um, suggest that in the Jewish tradition, there really are four modalities, uh, not simply to think about refugees and migrants, but to, uh, to literally put ourselves inside of that experience. And I'm going to refer to texts, sacred, sacred texts, rituals, holy days, and history. So let me begin with, with texts. Uh, we have in the Jewish tradition um, a number of very clear mandates as to our obligation regarding migrants and uh, refugees. The most potent is found in the 19th chapter of the book of Leviticus, chapter 33, where we're given a threefold progression. It says, When a, a stranger, you could put refugee, you could put migrant, lives with you in your land, it says, Lo tonu oto, you may not oppress. So the first obligation is to not oppress, not a very high bar. The second obligation is, uh, The stranger who resides with you, the refugee or the migrant, must be treated equally. Still not the highest bar. The last part of the verse gets us to the high bar. Ve'ahavta lo kamocha. You shall love that stranger as yourself. Why? Because you were once in his shoes. You know through your experience what that was like. So we have a text that's commanding not simply what we are to do, but how we're to get inside, to in a sense cultivate empathy, so that it's not simply an external obligation, but it's an internal experience that leads you to no other action than to welcome. If I could think about a second uh, area, which would be holy days. In the Jewish tradition, two of our holiest days are only about refugees and migrants. The first in the fall, we observe the Feast of Tabernacles, known in Hebrew as Sukkot. It is a holy day to remember what it was like to be on the journey. We're to live not in our homes, but in a fragile harvest booth, outside, uh, vulnerable to the wind and to the rain and to the sun. That is to remind us that we weren't always a settled people, that we actually have to recover what that experience is like. In the springtime, we observe the Passover holiday, which says, uh, we are to remember that our ancestors were wandering, nomad Arameans. They were both migrants and refugees. We're to eat bread that's not delicious. It's dry, it's hard, it's tasteless like the desert. Why? Because we could forget, given our situations in various moments in history, that we are no longer those refugees and those migrants. In the entire five books of Moses, the opening of the Hebrew Bible, we never get to home. We're always on the journey. We're in the wilderness. We're not settled. And it is a reminder that in the course of our weekly lectionary, we never arrive into that next place, into that promised land, reminding us never to leave the consciousness of a people that is perennially on the way. The story of Abraham and Sarah is the story of spiritual migration. They're told to leave their home. Why? Not because it's a place of uh, scarcity, but because they need religious freedom. And they go on their journey, and there's that famous story of Abraham in his tent on a hot day, and he sees three migrants, maybe they're refugees, he's not sure, wandering by. And he runs out and he brings them into his tent. He has no idea that they're not simply homeless uh, people. Well, it turns out that they are none other than angels of the Most High. It reminds me of your teaching yesterday that to, first of all, know that we learn from migrants and refugees. It's not that they are beneficiaries of our goodness alone, but we actually need them to be the people and the communities that we are. Uh, Abraham discovers that there is in this uh, threesome, holy, holy news to be shared about justice, 
about new life and about healing. I'll move to a reflection on history. Uh, in the Jewish tradition, there have been epochs where we have lived in very hostile environments, not simply in our literature, but in our daily life. So that historical experience calls us to live and act in a particular sensitivity. So I think of particularly 1939, and I just reflect on the ship, the St. Louis. Uh, 937 individuals got aboard in Hamburg, Germany. They thought that they would be able to leave Germany and arrive to the land of freedom. That land could have been Cuba, could have been the United States. Uh, they went on their journey and were turned away at both ports and returned to Europe, uh, where many of them actually perished in the Holocaust. What was the argument made against these particular 937 travelers? Well, the argument that was made by the President of the United States and by officials of the government were that these were people who were dangerous. They were a security risk to the well-being of the United States. They were German citizens and they would have loyalty to Germany and we must not let them in for fear that they will change for the worse our community. I think of how we are in a similar moment and we hear the same arguments against the admission of refugees into our midst. Uh, and we think about uh, certainly current government policy in the United States around refugees. And oftentimes in the last months, we are distressed. We are feeling religiously challenged to oppose but yesterday, I would just point out that the Fourth Circuit in the United States upheld the Ninth Circuit decision that the executive order against the immigration, the, the travel ban, particularly on Muslims in the United States, is illegal and must be opposed on legal grounds, not just moral grounds and not only on religious grounds. So there is actually a progress to be stated. I would also point out that the attitude towards migrants and towards refugees is colored oftentimes by ethnicity, by religion. And so on the day that the first tra travel ban was issued, uh, back in February, in Victoria, Texas, uh, the local mosque was burned to the ground. And on that same day, the leaders of one of our reform congregations, we were just to note, we're the largest Jewish movement in North America, larger than the Orthodox and the Conservative combined. In this little small town, the Reform Synagogue, B'nai Israel, went to the leaders of the mosque and gave them a set of keys to the synagogue and said, you need a place to pray. You no longer have your house of prayer. Our house is now your house five times a day. Please sanctify our place. Well, we know that one of the moments, and again, we're talking about ethics and action today. I hope we'll get to a lot of action. What is it particularly that faith communities can do together to stand against the attitudes and the policies that lock the gates towards migrants and towards immigrants? Well, in some concrete ways, our congregations are becoming sanctuaries. Even our summer camp in Bruceville, Texas, has been housing uh, uh, children from Central America, while the government, while we fight out the legality, we put them in our summer camps during the year so that they could enjoy the benefits of that beautiful place. When the cemetery in Philadelphia, the Jewish cemetery, was desecrated, the Muslim, the Jewish, the Christian, the Buddhist, the Sikh, the Hindu community, we gathered together and we stood against hate. So the power in this place in this moment is not only political power and not only moral power but religious power as we stand against the policies that violate our faith and our core sense of right and wrong. My colleague at the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society, Mark Hetfield, said, and I'll quote his words, the famous words of Emma Lazarus on the pedestal of the Statue of Liberty read, give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to be free and until 1921, this was an accurate picture of our society in the United States. But under present law, it would be appropriate to add, as long as they come from Northern Europe, are not too tired, 
or too poor or slightly ill, never stole a loaf of bread, and can document their activities for the past two years. It's clear that we are at a, uh, a point of moral testing in the United States in particular, and I take both responsibility for and agitation towards those policies. And I would say that in comparison, in thinking about the Syrian Muslims who have been welcomed, not just into the country, but the last Syrian Muslim family that entered came to one of our congregations in Chicago, Am Shalom in Glencoe, Illinois. And I would say that whatever we've been able to do is still only a drop. But if you think about the 18,000 Syrian refugees that have been settled in the United States, if we compare that to Canada, which has 40,000 in that same period of time, there is a, certainly a comparison, but also a uh, example of how to do this work on a higher level. We also know that uh, last year the U.S. admitted from the Democratic Republic of Congo approximately 16,000. Um, and that's more refugees than any other nation took in. And overall, 85,000 refugees came to the U.S. last year, uh, more than any of the years of the Obama presidency. This year it was supposed to be 110,000. That was determined before our new president took office. But obviously that number is being reduced as we sit. And if 50,000 come in, it will be a miracle. So we are called to act. We are called not simply to talk and to pray and to hope. We're called to mobilize the strength that we possess, the power that is so much in our hands. And I would just conclude with two observations. One, I, I would just give you the ritual. I, I hold in my hands a prayer shawl. In the book of Numbers, we're told to pray with a prayer shawl and that it must be a, a four-cornered garment. And on each of the four corners are to be specially tied fringes, which are to remind us of the four corners of the earth. Now normally a, ta a prayer shawl, a talit, is made out of beautiful wool, black and white, very distinguished. Uh, this one is a piece of cloth that I bought in a refugee camp in Chad in 2005 when I was there as part of a humanitarian mission to uh, not only witness the Darfur genocide unfolding, but to help awaken the conscience of the world. So I, I decided in that moment to buy this piece of cloth. My daughter at that point, preparing for her bat mitzvah, helped me tie the ritual fringes onto this, this, uh, this talus. And I wear it every day, not simply to help me with my prayer, but to help me from forgetting, from forgetting who I am, where I come from, and my obligations, to remind me that I have on my body the four corners of the earth. I have the responsibility for the oneness of God is not an abstract concept, it is a prayer, it is a hope, it is a practice, it is a commitment. And I'll just conclude with the words of Emmanuel Levinas, the great French Jewish philosopher, who said that we come into the world already obligated by the gaze of another. The gaze of that other is not only something that haunts us, but awakens us and challenges us and moves us beyond our prayers and our talk to action. Let us look at the face of the other and let us feel the obligation. And hopefully in all of our faith traditions, we have the practice of internalizing the commitment, the empathy, because it's not simply a dry legal obligation. It is from the very fabric and the very core of our religious faith. Thank you.